we have a, a, a brother who is a guest tonight. And uh, he is a fellow brother from around, from Serbia. He's going to be ministering in just a second. I want to, I met him in 19, in 20, I mean, 2018, 2018. I met him in 2018, first met him, where we were there ministering in Serbia. And his father called for a, a meeting with me around the table. And I remember his father, Pastor Sheriff uh, Bakic, uh, it's kind of pretty good, pretty good. And so uh, uh, he called, and uh, I, my heart was knitted to that family and to that ministry. Uh, we were there doing some ministry there under uh, Pastor Sunjitsa, and uh, it, it was just a good time of meeting uh, Serbian brothers. And so I, I wanted to just say a few more things about him, except I'm going to let him do, do the preaching. So, but he, did a, he does a superb job of, of ministry. He does a superb job of music. I think there's no musical instrument that he cannot play. It's just amazing. He's a pastor. He's a, he's a preacher of the word. And uh, just a man who loves Jesus Christ so much. When you, uh, we have brothers and sisters coming from around the world. We've had brothers and sisters coming from around the world. Um, I, I think that's appropriate. I think it's right to have them come here because as we go there. And they're coming here. Amen. And so uh, this is uh, uh, Pastor Misha's last uh, night in Texas for uh, this period. This is last night. And so uh, we're going to have him share the word. And then we'll come back a little bit later afterwards. So I'm going to just ask you to give Pastor Misha Bakich a big hand. Thank you, guys. Oh, I did not expect that, to be honest. Uh, so, uh, good evening, brothers and sisters. Or, uh, let me say, buenas noches, hermanos y hermanas. Is that right? Did, did I, good, I, I did a good job? Okay. So, it's, it's, it's all of that watching television, you know, the telenovelas, it has finally paid off now. Okay, I'm, I am I'm super glad, I'm super excited, and it's really my absolute honor to be here among you guys. And I was, uh, so uh, I, I can see my clock here ticking, so, uh, and uh, when I was in Australia, I, I, I shared this, and I said, you know, guys, it's, uh, I, I was invited there to go for a conference and preach, and, and I was, as I was preaching, I said, you know, it's going to take about two or three hours uh, for me to finish my message, and all of the people of God say, "Amen." amen. Yeah, so. And just to be clear, I did see those who did not say "Amen," <laughs> and those did I did not see. Uh, we got you on camera, so I'm going to be watching. And uh, I said the same thing. You know, it's going to take me a long time to finish my message, and then the pastor, the Australian pastor from the church, just yells to me, and goes, shouts out to me, and goes, "Hey." No worries, mate. Just turn off the lights when you finish. <laughs> and I go, okay. Mes message understood. Message understood. <laughs> it's funny. I'm glad you find that funny. Uh, so my name is Misha. I come from Serbia. I am married, I have two kids, and I bring a lot of greetings from Pastor Sunchitsa, uh, Sasha, Yelena, the whole church in Croatia, but also I bring a lot of greetings from my own church in Leskovas, from Pastor Sherry, Pastor Bowen, and the whole team. Guys, we love you, and uh, you have no idea how much, but we really love you, we value you guys, your ministry, your Christ-centeredness, and I just, it, I just really find it um, amazingly privileged to be among here but I want to share a message with you and you know it's somehow a little bit hard at the beginning but I promise uh, I promise you just stick up with me I know you'll be encouraged at the end amen church amen. so if we can have the first slide I, I want to talk about names it is it is interesting right that one of the first things that we say to each other is my name is right it's, you know, it's one of the first things that we want to know is what's somebody's name. 
And it's very interesting to me, as, as, as I was fascinated by this, I started studying the Word of God, and it's interesting to notice that uh, naming things, naming stuff, is God's idea. It was God who would, after He would create something, He would give a name to that, whatever that He would create. And it's, it's just fascinating to see what God will do with that name. And so what I want to share with you now is that it's, 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 I find it very fascinating that everything has a name. That everybody has a name. And that we, I can just say Pastor Don and everybody knows who we talk about. And it is God's idea that God would name everything. And then when he created everything, he would do two things. He would name the thing and he would proclaim it was good. So he would name the thing, and he would say it was good. So it's amazing to see the names and that development of names. But what I want to share with you is that, that, there is, that there is a deeper message than just a sound when we say a name. And it was very well understood by God, of course. It was very well understood by the first people. And by Israelis, and, and we will see this, but you see, when God created Adam, he named him Adam. God created men, and God named him. Which means, okay, so what does a, a name mean? Let, let me get to my point. A name represents two things. And the first is identity. Okay, God named him and said, you are going to be human being. This is how you're going to be different from, from the whole creation. This is who you are. You are a man. And th this is Adam means a man. And this is, you know, this is what's going to differentiate between you and the whole other creation. This is, so name is who you are. But also, just watch this with me, please. It's who you will be. It's your destiny. Amen. Amen. So when God named Adam, he said, this is who you are. You are a man. But also, this is who you will be. You will be a ruler. You will rule among all of the creation. So when God is naming things, he's giving destiny, he's giving character, he's giving identity, yeah, and he's giving destiny. Amen, church? And it was very well understood. But here is another thing that I find also fascinating, is that whoever gets to name the thing or the person is the one who takes authority over what he names. So when God created Adam, he named him Adam, which means that God is authority over Adam. And God says, you're a human being. This is your identity. And you're going to be a ruler. This is who you will be. This is your ministry. And, and, and then this, is, this means that God was above Adam in authority. But then God created all of the creations. And then he brought all of the animals. And God named the animals. Right? No. No. So what God does is God says, okay, I want you to be ruler of the creation. I want you to be authority. So what God does is God creates the animals, but then God takes all of the animals and brings them to Adam. So, and Adam then names all of the animals, which means now Adam is the one who names, and whoever names is the one who has authority. And this is even in the natural when we as parents, we name our children, this means that we are their natural authority before God and before the government. Is that right? Okay. And this was very well understood that whoever names the, the thing or the person gets to be the authority over the name of, 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 the, of over the person or the thing. But somewhere down the line, this all gets really messed up. Because at first, you can see with Adam and his family, they would, when they would get children as a gift from God, they would look up to God and they would name their children accordingly. They would name their children with God-glorifying names. They would name their children and they would give glory to God by just saying their name. But then we go down the road and then we see that when it came to Israel, Israel understood this well. But then a little by little, instead of looking to God and naming their children, they start looking at the world. They start looking at what's happening in the world, what's happening among them. And remember, the one who names is the one who has authority, and the one who names gives identity and gives destiny. 
So we come to a point of some people in Israel naming their child Ben-Omi. Which means my sorrow, my sadness, my disaster. And I, I mean, can you imagine? And this would be their identity and this would be their destiny. And, and we come to a position where people would name their, their, their kids like Mara, which means just an unpleasant person. Because when they would look into the world, they would see sadness, unpleasantness. They would see all of these bad things. And then they would name their children according to what they see. And this is how we come to one of the most interesting stories that I find in the scripture. Which is the story of Jacob. So, because my, my time is going really fast, I'm, I'm going to be really quick with this. Somehow, even in the womb, he understood that, that, that I want to be the first one to come out. Okay? And he, he was fighting his brother. I mean, I re- this one, if you want to get confused, if you want to get excited, you know, read Jacob. Read Jesus, of course. Jesus is always the most exciting guy. But this guy is like, so... His brother is coming out first, and then he somehow, I don't want to be graphic here, but he goes and grabs his brother by the leg. And I was like, he's like, come on, come in here. I want to be the first one to come out. And then when, when his mom is looking at this, remember, she's not looking at God and asking God, okay, what do I name him? What kind of destiny do you have for him? What kind of identity do you have for him? She's looking at the situation. And she goes, I will name him Jacob. And now, Jacob sounds great in English. Uh, Yaakov sounds great in the Serbian. But in the Hebrew language, Jacob means deceiver or deception. Now, c- can you imagine naming your child deceiver? Him going to school and, you know, Mark is here. You know, Daniel is here. John is here. Deceiver is here as well. You know, it just... You know, it's, it must have been a nightmare. And, you know, this guy growing up and he has all of his friends, you know, hey, is the silver around here? Oh, no, he's, he's somewhere else. You know, can you imagine the silver being a pastor of the church? <laughs> it's like, and now we're going to have brothers and sisters. Now we're going to have our brother, the silver, and he's going to preach about honesty. And you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. But this is who he is. And I know it sounds funny, but what's really sad is that when you get to look at the life of Jacob, I see two things. Everything that he does is deception. And everything that other people do to him is deception. And I think he's one of the most colorful characters in the scripture. Why? Because this was the identity that he had. And this was the destiny that was given by his parents. To be deception. You know, he, 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 he cheated on his father. He deceived his father. Pretended to be someone else. To get a blessing from the father. He's running away from his brother. He, his brother wants to kill him. He's running away. He goes to his uncle. Now he founds in love with, with a girl there. He works seven years to get that man. Man. Seven years. Okay, He works seven years to get this girl. And then finally, when he gets her, it turns out it's really not her. Then he, work, he needs to work seven more years to get the actual, the right one. So his life is a mess. He ends up with having two wives. Okay. And if that, if that isn't a nightmare enough, okay, get, get, get this. Just, just get this, please. The wives are sisters. Now, if, if man... And now, there is the one that he loves, okay, yeah, this, the one that he loves cannot bear children. The one that he doesn't love can have children. And this one is teasing the other one. And now, it, they're both unhappy. He's unhappy, the whole family. I mean, look at this. He's, his whole life has been frustration. His uncle cheating on him, he's cheating on other people. Everything that he does is deception. Everything that other people do to him is deception. And he's just sick of it. He's absolutely, you know, frustration after frustration after frustration. He's absolutely sick of it. And one day, if we can turn to Genesis 32, 22 to 28. It says, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, okay, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And the man wrestled with him till the daybreak. 
Okay, so now we have a situation. He comes and he goes, okay, I want everybody in my life to be gone. Go at the other side. I want my family, everything that I possess, I want out of me. And he goes and he wrestles with this man all night long. And, and when I read all night long until the dawn, you know, this tells me just how desperate he was. This is frustration after frustration after frustration, disappointment. I am a deceiver. I've been doing, I've been doing that all of my life. And all of the people in my life are doing that to me. I am miserable. My family is falling apart. Everything in my life is going really bad. And he finds a man, which turns out to be Jesus. He finds a man and, and, and he fights with him. He wrestles with him all night long. You know, sometimes my, my, my five-year-old girl, I will wrestle with her for five minutes and I get tired. But, but, but man, he, he wrestled with, with Jesus all night long. All night long. And finally, after all of this wrestling, he comes to say one thing. I am not going to let you go unless you bless me. And you can just see the desperation. I'm not going to, this is what I've been working all of my life. I had to pretend to be someone else just to be blessed by my father. Everything I've done, I just wanted to, just wanted to get the blessings of the father. And he said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And now, do we believe that God knows everything? Do you believe that? Amen. But now we come to a strange question. Which is this. God says, okay, what's your name? Does God, does God not know what his name is? Oh, God knows what his name is very, very well. But you have to understand that. Last time, when somebody, like his earthly father, asked him, who are you? He was pretending to be someone else was pretending to be Esau. He even got some hair put on his arms and said, Dad, I am Esau. He would do everything just to get the Father's blessing. And now God is saying, okay, who are you? Are you Jacob? Or are you Esau? Who are you? And then he finally goes, Lord, I'm Jacob. This is who I am. And we know that, hey, we serve God of a blessing. Amen. We serve God who loves to bless. And we know that God blessed him. Okay, but I want you to watch this. How did God bless Jacob? The first thing that God does is this. Is God changes his name. The first thing that God does is God changes his name. The first thing that God goes, okay, from today on, no longer will you be deception. From today on, I am taking authority over you. I am naming you. I'm giving, I'm giving you a different name. And from today on, I will be the one who will prophesy who you are. I will be the one who will tell you what you're going to do. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to go with you. And you're going to be blessing to all of the nations. Amen, church. This is what God did with him. From today on, enough has been enough. Enough that other people tell you who you are. Enough that other people get to define your identity. From today on, God says, I will bless you. And I have a very short time, but I want to tell you a few stories, if I may. You guys excited? Good. I am Roma, and my name, Roma, has been my greatest struggle. Because Roma in my language means a human being. And the greatest struggle of my nation remains to prove that we are human beings to others. It's unreal. Sadly, we know that that during the Holocaust, there were 
during the Holocaust, there were, there, there were about six million Jews exterminated, killed, ruthlessly. But not many people know that there were about 1.5 million Roma killed. The second most persecuted group right after the Jews were the Roma. It came directly from Hitler's heart to clean up all of Europe from the Roma people. My great-grandfather, his brother, his, his brother-in-law, many, many, many other people were killed because of this idea that the Roma people are not human beings. You know what's even more sad? That there was a movement right until 2010, a movement of churches somewhere in Eastern Europe. I'm not gonna name the country. I was there and the movement said, do not go and preach the gospel to the gypsies. Gypsy is a derogatory term that other people will use for the Roma. Do not go and preach the gospel. Do not. Because they do not have a soul. This is what the, the church would preach. And for most of my life, this has been my greatest struggle. To show to other people that I am a human being. And I have so many other things I have so many other examples that, 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 that the belief, like the only, uh, uh, the only, um, what's the word? Um, let, let, let me give you another story. The, I was watching a, a show, a, a British show, and one of the main characters was uh, partly Roma or Gypsy, they would call it. And then he would just go through all, of these, through all of these issues in his life. And he would always say, the reason why I go through all of these things is because I'm gypsy. And we are cursed by God. And the reason why we are cursed by God, he would say, is that when Jesus was nailed on the cross, it was the gypsies that made the nails for Jesus' cross. I mean, I, I can tell you stories, but... I, I grew up with these stories. I grew up with a story that says there was a mother and a child. And the child was asking mother, Mom, why is the sky so far away from us? Why is it? Because this is where God lives. Why is it so far away from us? And then the mother would say to the child, Well, long time ago, there was one Roma family. And God was very near to the people. God was living with the people. But then this Roma family did not have what to eat. So the mother of the child took a little bit of his poo, put it on bread, and gave the child to eat. And when God saw this, he was so disgusted that he took away the heavens and the sky because of the Roma people. This is what Roma kids are growing out with that the reason why why Jesus was on the cross was because we made the nails that the reason why God is quote unquote far away from us is because we, we are disgusting that God is disgusted by the Roma people and right in this mess 1996 in all of this mess my father was a communist hated God hated God and then I have an older brother so my older brother got sick took him to the doctor one hospital second hospital third hospital long story short they go to the capital they do all of the tests they do surgeries chemotherapy that's it the doctor comes out and says to my dad I'm really sorry but your 10-year-old child is dying. The cancer had spread all throughout his body. There is nothing that we can do. Take the kid home because he's not going to live for more than a month. My dad takes the phone to call us and to let us know what's happening. And he's, he's losing it. He cannot speak. He's not barking like a dog. 
my mom is losing it. She started, she started talking to the walls. They brought him home. All of the community comes. And everybody, they, they're, they're taking everything out of their pockets. They say, we want to help. Come on, let's, let's find a cure for him in America, in Russia, where, wherever. But the, the thing is that the cancer has spread all throughout his body. He's just lying on the bed. And everybody just waiting for him to die. The church is underground. It's communism. It's a communist time. God's dead. There isn't God. And my dad was a communist. My dad was obligated by the law to report if there was any religious activity in the community. But one night, somebody comes and knocks on our door. And my dad goes, who is this? And there happened to be some cousins of my mother. And they come and they say, you know what? We know who you are. We know that you are a communist. And we know that you can even report us to the police. But this is what we want to do. This is what we want to say to you. We are Christians. We believe in God. And we believe if you allow us and we pray for your son, God's going to heal your son from cancer. <laughs> My father looks at them and goes, okay, come in, you know. I don't care if I'm going to lose my job, if I'm going to go to prison. I don't care what's going to happen with me. If you say that you have a cure for my son, it's, it's, it's a God. I would love to have it. So please come in. They came in. They went on their knees. My brother is on the bed. We're all waiting for him to just die. They went on their knees praying for him. The moment they end up the prayer, my, started, my brother started feeling better. His hair started to come back. He started eating. He's feeling great. And one month, two months go by, and we're like, we have, we as a family, we're like, okay, something is happening. Something is happening. We got to take him and do the tests again. So they took my brother to Belgrade, the capital, to the same hospital, the same doctors. And the doctors did the test, and the doctors comes out and goes, the machine is broken. We have to do the tests again, okay? So they do the tests again. And, and, and they go, and they, they invited my father, and there's a whole consilium of doctors, the, the, the whole team. And they're all watching the results before and after. And they ask my father, okay, tell us what did you do with the child? Because this is impossible. Your son had cancer, but now he's completely cancer-free. There is absolutely no cancer in your son's body. And this is how my father... Okay, this is how my father came to Christ. We as a family came to Christ. And this is the moment that God started the biggest revival in the Roma community. That now there are more than 40 churches in Serbia, churches in Sweden, churches in Croatia, churches in Germany. And God is doing amazing things. But why? Okay, let, let me ask you this. But why? It's because one day Jesus said, it's enough. It's enough. From today on i am going to be the one who's going to prophesy over the roma i'm going to be the one who's going to tell you who you are what you will do what you will look like what you will minister like i am going to be your god i'm going to bless you i'm going to be with you i'm changing your identity and i'm giving you a new destiny amen church jesus jesus but let me bring you back to the story One day, as Jacob is having one of his sons named Benjamin being born, his wife is dying as she's delivering the child. And she takes her last breath to bring curse upon the child. She takes her last breath and she goes, as she's dying, she goes, his name will be Ben-Omi. Ben-Omi in the Hebrew means my sorrow. And that moment we see something amazing. 
because God gave new identity to Jacob. God gave a new destiny to Jacob. Jacob stood up and said, no, I'm not going to allow this. I'm not going to allow another destroyed child in my life. I'm not going to allow that his identity be sorrow and destruction and sadness. No, his name is going to be Benjamin. And right there, Jacob changed his name. And this is what God is calling us. God is calling us to bless and not to curse. God is calling us to raise up a new generation of people who are going to change the world but listen this church some 2,000 years after that the greatest apostle who have ever lived the greatest apostle who wrote two-thirds of the scripture proudly says and I apostle Paul Paul and says and I am from the tribe of Benjamin and I am from the tribe of Benjamin. Why? Because there was somebody who said, no, it's enough is enough. Brothers and sisters, you know that thorns were never part of God's creation. It just wasn't part of God's creation. And when, God, and when sin entered the earth as a physical manifestation of the sin, the thorns came out. Which means that there was a curse. And God said, cursed is the lamb because of you. Thorns are going to come out. But hanging out with this guy, I'm learning to see everything through the eyes of Jesus. And to see Jesus in everything. So what, that Je what Jesus did, is he goes to the cross. He takes the crown off of thorns he takes absolutely every curse puts it on his head and he, ha and he said it is finished from today on i'm going to be the one who's going to give you a new identity from today on i'm going to prophesy differently upon you it doesn't matter i'm not, not i'm not going to allow other people to tell you who you are i'm not going to allow other people to tell you your past your sins in the past to tell you who you are i'm not going to allow your ethnicity your background your nationality to tell you who you are from today on on the cross jesus is staying who we are in him through him and for him and to him be the glory guys i love you so much god bless you it's been a great pleasure being among you pastor don thank you again